She only hits you up after 1 a.m. She leaves her red receipts on. She's constantly going on vacation. I'm talking like bi-weekly, posting Instagram pictures, but you never once see someone else with her in those pictures, okay? Glaring red flags in the dating game here in NYC. No different than fantasy football. There are some glaring red flags in 95% of the players out there that aren't the top three at their position. So what I wanted to do today was transfer over the dating game to fantasy football. When we see red flags, we avoid them. Not completely. You know, there's a time and place for red flags in life as there is in fantasy football. If it's the right value, you're looking for a rebound, etc. They can fit your life. They can fit your team. They can fit your roster. But you don't want to litter yourself with red flags because then you become a broken man. I'm projecting right now, okay? Fuck you guys. Leave me alone. Today, we are talking about the running backs. Top 24 running backs per ADP right now. And I made a nice little chart for you. I made a nice little graph. You know, I went above and beyond for y'all. And we're going to try to objectively look at the biggest red flags in running backs or point out the running backs who have the biggest red flags for 2022 fantasy football. All right. First thing we got to do, y'all know, tuck your shirts in. Yeah. Stop yelling. Let's see. When it comes to running backs, you need we, we kind of know what makes up a good fantasy football player, or at least what gives you a ceiling. It's it's a combination of things like just overall volume, of course, and efficiency, run blocking line, being on a good team that affords you a lot of goal line and scoring opportunities, right? There are not a lot of players that can score from 35 yards out in the NFL, right? There are not a lot of players that can score from 50 yards out or 70 yards out. So most of the time when people score a lot of touchdowns, they come from within 10 or 5 yard line. You need to be on a good team in order for those opportunities to arise for this single player. You know, like I said, run blocking line, targets, right? There, it's a mix of these other, it's like pulling levers, okay? Or, or making a cocktail, right? There are many cocktails to be made. Margarita being the best, but there are espresso martinis. You know, there are all these different, whatever you want to, whatever sinks your submarine. And the end result could be great, but... If you start mixing the cocktail incorrectly, it's a red fucking flag. If you're at a party and you see somebody drinking tequila with gin, with orange juice, with Splenda, and a squirt of ketchup, there's a fucking problem here. We've got a problem here, okay? And some of these fantasy football players this year got some ketchup in their cocktails. So what we're going to do is run through the list of the top 24. And I think it's important to address first and foremost. So I made this graph. We'll put it on the screen for you. And the way this box was made there's a lot of numbers right now so just bear with me as we kind of go through the um, the overall gist of what we're trying to do here what i'm trying to yell at y'all here for so basically we look at volume overall volume right rushes targets together so how much volume is this guy going to get if he stays healthy so i think it's important to address right because red flags obviously there there are injury concerns when it comes to red flags that's a that's a big one okay but i think it's important to address the fact that most injuries are not actually predictive and most injuries will not impact your next year's play. So there are a lot of guys this year who we want to project injuries into their outlook, though nothing that has happened in the past will actually project the injury on top of them. So when when we talk about volume here, I'm talking about volume, assuming that they are healthy. Like what does their workload look like if they are on the field? So you have C-Mac, you have Dalvin Cook, you have Derrick Henry, all guys who without a doubt are going to get RB1, you know, top value or top volume if they stay healthy. None of those guys are coming off of torn Achilles or torn ACLs or anything like that. There are a couple guys on this list that are. And again, I did not do a category for injury, but I think it's kind of self-explanatory when we look at, you know, off the top of the head, we have Cam Akers, we have Travis Etienne, we have Dobbins. I didn't actually address those injuries in this chart, but they're already at the bottom of the list. So you can kind of tweak that into their injury analysis. And I'll, I'll go over each of those individually as I've listened to a few injury podcasts over uh, the last 24, 48 hours to make sure we address this. But we have overall volume in terms of just, you know, carries plus targets. And overall volume is important. Next column is targets. You know, so how often is this person being targeted in their offense? You have run blocking line. So what I did for run, run blocking line in one through five is basically how I scaled every one of these categories. So one being the lowest. So if you have a one in targets, that means, you know, you see Elijah Mitchell all the way at the bottom of the board there with a one down there. You see he gets very, very few targets in his offense. Five being the highest. So you've got like Christian McCaffrey, you know, a five out of the targets. Run blocking line is actually based off of PFF's run blocking grade for the team last year. And I tried to account for, you know, moves and stuff this year a little bit. I didn't want to project too much because we're not good at doing that. 
basically what I did, we ranked them one through 32. So whoever was the single best run blocking line last year, I believe it was the, I want to say it was the Cowboys. Whoever that was got a five, right? The first six teams got a five. The next six teams got a four. The next six teams got a three. So depending on where they graded out last year. And then again, like for instance, the Bengals graded out, they would have a two, but they order, they added a lot of firepower to the offensive line. So I moved them up to the three. So there were a few things that I tweaked that were subjective to it. But for the most part, I went off how they played last year and then just use like a little bit of common sense. So the run blocking line is actually based off PFF grades, goal line work. So this there's two categories here that have goal line work. Goal line work for the player is like basically the percentage of the goal line work that that guy gets for his team. Goal line opportunities in terms of a team is like this list is actually, you know, red zone opportunities. So just in terms of overall volume. So you see Jonathan Taylor there with a five. That means Indianapolis was ranked top six or seven in terms of actual red zone opportunities per game last year and going on and so forth. And so that one's actually like objective. There were numbers and stats to do it. Goal line work was a little bit of self-projection, a little bit of common sense. Like for instance, Austin Eckler had a ton of goal line carries last year, but I'm projecting Isaiah Spiller to eat into that a little bit. So I have him down at a three instead of like a four or five where he might've actually been if you just strictly went off goal line work last year. Um, so that's how that works. So goal line work for players, like the, the, the share of the goal line work that player is going to get for his team. Goal line opportunities for the team is actually like, overall you know how much score how many scoring opportunities is that team going to get like per game the last category is breakaway playability so big plays like you see jonathan taylor he, the guy rips off 70 yard runs christian mccaffrey when he's healthy rips off like 60 yard catches derrick henry obviously like a five there as well so this one was subjective this one i didn't necessarily go off like 40 times i didn't go off like 40 plus yard rush plays it's just like the experience that i've had with these players a lot of them i've had on my fantasy teams before so it's like when you're watching them over and over and over again like how often does it happen like joe mixon doesn't really make that many big plays especially relative to like the volume that he has so i put him on a three because he's like capable of it he's got good athleticism but it, it kind of rarely happens okay so you have guys like like down at two, Ezekiel Elliott. Okay. And I, like, maybe he could have been like a one, but he very rarely breaks off like 40 yard plays. He doesn't have like explosiveness that he had when he was younger, got a little bit less wiggle. So I put him as a two again, that last row is like one of the few that's actually subjective in this, but I just wanted to get like the overall gist onto paper for y'all. So I did that for everyone in the ADP of one through 24. And then we sorted it by score. And you could see this new chart where the score goes from highest to lowest. And, you know, you could say the most red flags here. You can go by red flags, like who has the most actual red on their profile. Like you see Travis Etienne has two ones on there. You see, um, I don't know if another player actually has two ones on there, but this is a way to kind of like hold myself accountable and actually objectively look at red flags here because I love Travis Etienne. But you can say that Jacksonville's offensive line was fucking terrible. They were like 31st in the league in run blocking. Yes, they might have added a couple pieces, and they did, right? They did address the offensive line, but you can go from 29th to 25th and still be a terrible run blocking line. Like, just because you added a few pieces or a piece, like these things, these changes happen over time, you know? And again, like you guys can kind of tweak numbers and shit. The overall gist of it is like, okay, let's put the Jaguars at a two for run blocking line or even a three. Like Travis Etienne, the red flags are still there, right? Like his score goes up a little bit, but he's still in that bottom tier of running backs as it, as it relates to red flags. So surprisingly, we have some guys all the way at the top that, you know, you might think are really, really high up there. But Leonard Fournette, I've been talking about how he's, you know, I'm, I'm really in on Leonard Fournette because he's getting monster volume. He was getting 20 touches. I mean, in the playoff run they had last year, uh, in the playoff run the year before, the amount of volume he got like midway through the year towards the end of the year, workhorse, like top three in the NFL type workload. No reason not to think he gets that. Uh, target wise, I mean, he got 90 targets in like 14 games last year. Run blocking line. They're a great offensive line. Goal line work as the player. He's the guy that's going to get all the goal line work. Ronald Jones is not there. Like who else is taking goal line work there? Realistically, goal line opportunities. This is one of the highest scoring teams in the NFL. Blake, uh, breakaway play uh, ability. I put him at a three, but I think you can even argue that it might, it, it could be a little bit higher, right? He's got great speed for his size, but he doesn't necessarily break away all the time. So I don't want to put him like in the Jonathan Taylor scope where Jonathan Taylor does that like once every other game. But realistically, I mean, that that's the thing. It's like, I guess if you want to factor competition into any slot, it would be in the volume role. I just don't really think Lenny has a lot of competition this year for volume. So you guys, again, subjectively can start tweaking things. You want to add in a little bit of an injury concern. You can do so. I didn't want to do that for everybody because I don't really know the mechanics behind every injury, although I am technically a doctor. So for Fournette's really high. Zeke is another guy that's super high. So you might say like, Zeke, why is his volume up at four? You know why? Because his targets are going to be super fucking high. Is it possible Tony Pollard eats into like his rushing work a little bit? Sure, it could happen. 
but he got a ton of work and then he tore his PCL last year. So his work went down a little bit. But if you look, uh, look at his target totals over the last four years, 65, 71, 71, 95. Like he's averaging 75 targets per season. And now you're looking at an offense that just lost Amari Cooper. Michael Gallup's coming back from a torn ACL. Like they're going to need to use the running back and Zeke in the passing game a lot. You know, I put his big playability all the way down too because he doesn't break out much. But goal line opportunities, he still absolutely dominated the share of goal line work on this team. They had a great run blocking line. So I think if you look at Zeke objectively, I think there's a lot to like about this profile, even though he's one of those players that like seems like he's over the hill. I'm, I'm very much in on, on Zeke at, at that like four, that round four spot. But let's let's move down because I, you know, this video is about red fucking flags. If we move to the, I guess like the bottom, you know, the uh, let's let's say like the last six guys. We have Jacobs, Antonio Gibson, James Conner, Elijah Mitchell, Travis Etienne, J.K. Dobbins. Okay. So Jacobs is a guy whose volume, it feels like he gets a lot of volume, but he has some games where they're winning and he gets like 20 carries per game, but he very rarely has games where he's getting like 25 touches because the carries and the targets added up together. Um, he got a lot more targets than I actually gave him credit for. He, he saw a pretty decent amount of uh, work in the passing game, but I think this is like kind of the inverse of Aaron Jones, where because you're adding Devontae Adams, that takes targets away from the running backs. I forget who did a Someone did like a really good study about this, about how vacated targets a lot of the times go to the running back when a big time wide receiver leaves someone who's gotten over like 100 120 targets a lot of times those are supplemented by being given to the running back position so i think we'll see a little bit of an inverse effect here i don't really think the raiders have ever wanted to give josh jacobs like a ton of uh, a ton of passing work so i put him at three there but overall i mean run blocking line yeah believe it or not they were one of if not actually they might have been the worst run blocking line in the nfl last year maybe it was injuries maybe it was whatever but it was a big concern for josh jacobs and it's going to be a big concern for his efficiency goal line work yeah he'll take the uh the majority of the goal line work there of course goal line opportunities is probably going to be a pretty big offense but he doesn't make a lot of big plays so you're talking about a guy who's like we don't really know his involvement in the passing game his calling card is his rushing ability on early downs but he's behind a really bad offensive line and he doesn't make explosive plays to me that's not a cocktail that i want to be drinking out of when it comes to fantasy so he's not exciting for me antonio gibson his volume i probably could have put at two they they actually graded out great in a uh, run blocking line there in washington last year surprisingly and I, I don't know there's much else going for him because with jd mckissick there brian robinson there like does he dominate goal line work? Does that does this team get on the goal line often? You know, does he get a lot of volume? Probably not. So Gibson's a guy that I think has one of the most red flaggy type profiles. Basically combines everything I said at the, like at the beginning of the video. She hits you up at 1 a.m. and then when you answer, she leaves you on red and does not fucking reply to it. When you hit her back the next day, she posts a picture on vacation in fucking Belize with her hand back like this, touching somebody, but you got no idea who that motherfucker is. That's what Antonio Gibson is. James Conner is one that's going to surprise a lot of people because. I think there's going to be a lot of argument this offseason between who to take between Fournette and Connor. And prior to this video, prior to me doing this chart, like I was on Fournette's side and then looking at it, I think I need to hammer home a few things here, right? I made a video, the uh, running back rankings video, 11 to 20 last week, or yeah, last week, we'll link that in the description. James Conner, I started off, I believe he's the RB11, and I listed a lot of individual stats that said that James Conner was just not a very good running back last year outside of scoring touchdowns. So you might think that he was like a workhorse and got a ton of volume. James Conner got 202 carries last year and 37 catches. Like, that's not that much volume. That's really not a lot of volume. 202 carries last year. Okay, so you're looking at, that's like 13 to 14 a game, and you're talking about like, a little bit over like two to two and a half targets per game. So the volume's not anywhere near as high as you probably think it is. Again, the targets, he only had 39 targets on the year in 15 games. Chase Edmonds is gone, so it's possible that he takes a little bit more uh, work in that game, but they do have Keontae Ingram. They do have Eno Benjamin. So we'll see. Maybe could have put him at three for targets. The run blocking line last year actually graded out horribly. They were 31st. So in terms of run blocking, Houston Texans dead last, Arizona Cardinals 31st, Miami Dolphins 30th, the Raiders 29th, the Jaguars 28th. So those are the bottom teams in terms of run blocking. The Arizona Cardinals were terrible. And you saw it in his 3.7 yards per carry. So we're talking about a terrible run blocking line. Again, a guy who makes his money off of early downs and scoring touchdowns. Bad run blocking line. Goal line work. Yeah, he's going to get a lot of the goal line work. The majority of the goal line work in Arizona is going to go to him. The reason I put him four is because he's playing with Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray is going to get his share of, you know, inside the five yard carries. Uh, goal line opportunities. Yes, they they put themselves in the scoring position pretty fucking often. Breakaway plays, uh, the ability. Connor's not a guy who's rushing for 50 yards on a, uh, on a given pop. So I think an individual player analysis of James Connor, there's something here that spooks me. There's something here that spooks me, and there's a reason why he landed a little bit lower on this list. So 
I'm not sold on James Conner. There's I mean, obviously there's a lot to like, and he's in a situation where like, of course, if everything just happens exactly how it happened last year, he's going to be fucking awesome for fantasy football. But I don't like betting on like these crazy kind of outlier things where everything else tells you that it like wasn't actually as good as it seemed on paper. Underneath him, we got Elijah Mitchell. And the, you know, the story behind Mitchell is basically that he just simply does not get targets. The guy does not get fucking targets. And the other problem is like, you know, they, they bring TDP in. They have Jeff Wilson coming back. They have Trey Sermon. Goal line work. He did not lead the team in goal line carries last year. Obviously, he missed some time. He played 11 games. He was awesome in between the 20s and on first and second down. But goal line opportunities and goal line work as a player, also with Trey Lance under center, like there's other players getting carries here, possibly on the goal line. Like Jeff Wilson has games where he gets five goal line carries. Trey Lance is obviously going to take way more goal line carries than Jimmy G would have, assuming he's the quarterback this year. So I think there are enough red flags with Elijah Mitchell that, you know, you might look at his ADP of like running back 20 to 24 and be like, how is he going this low? But I, I think it's glaringly fucking obvious what his red flags are going into this year. Travis Etienne behind a terrible run blocking line. Also, I put his volume at three. That might that might even be generous because we don't know what James Robinson's um, deal is. I don't think he will be able to like really contribute to this team until like November with the with the torn Achilles. So I put Travis Etienne getting most of the work, but who fucking knows? Maybe they have a bigger back that they want to use on the goal line. I don't know. He should get a ton of fucking targets. Uh, goal line work as a player. Again, I put him at two. That that might be undershooting. I think there's a chance that you can put volume up to four. There's a chance that you could put goal line work up to three. But Trevor Lawrence is also really, really good on the goal line. Don't forget what he did at Clemson. 17 touchdowns, rushing touchdowns over the final two years there. And they might use a bigger back. So I don't know. I don't want to project onto him all this success just because I like him as a player. I'm trying to be objective here. Goal line opportunities as a team. Again, this is not a good team. This is not, no matter how optimistic we can be about them improving, we went off the numbers here. I went off of red zone scoring opportunities. Of course, they're going to be way fucking better this year without Urban Meyer, but I don't want to get ahead of our fucking skis because we might still be a year away from being like really excited about this offense. So Travis Etienne and J.K. Dobbins tie for the minimum of the red flag score. J.K. Dobbins is a guy that, with his ACL tear, I was listening to, there was a really, really good podcast that dropped today, and we'll link it down below as well. I threw it into our Discord, so if you're not in our Discord, I would I would go join that. We've got it linked down below. It's from the uh, Injury Prone Podcast from Edwin Porras. He's one of the uh, doctors in the fantasy space, and he interviewed another doctor by the name of Deepak Chona uh, at Sport. MD analysis. They went in on basically every injured player from last year going into this year. Uh, they're not concerned about J.K. Dobbins, both of them, from an ACL perspective. He'll be uh, pretty good to go this year. That being said, though, I feel like they wanted to use a committee before he got hurt. I wouldn't be surprised now that he did get hurt if they try to use a committee. I mean, they brought in, I hate that they fucking brought in Mike Davis. I hate it. He's like, he's not good at all, but he's going to piss us off for fantasy. So I put Dobbins' as volume at two, and I think a lot of you guys will probably argue with that. Listen, I don't think he's going to be the workhorse there. I don't think they just give him 20 to 22 touches a game. I think maybe like 14 to 16 is realistic. That volume could probably be put up to three. I don't, I don't deny that. Targets, we have yet to see them really target a running back in full capacity. I think this year, with all the injuries last year, right? Like we're looking at Baltimore's team last year. They went really pass heavy. They didn't want to do that. You don't want to do that with Lamar Jackson. You want to be like a tough fucking running team that you don't know where the ball is going to go at the line of scrimmage. They, that's what they want to do. And with Lamar Jackson, when they have all the running backs get hurt, right? When they have fucking J.K. Dobbins go down and Gus Edwards go down, all those guys go down quickly. Like you don't really have a choice. You can't just continue to run the ball with undrafted free agents and 32-year-old veteran Devontae Freeman over and over and over again. They had to go away from their game plan. They will be back to being a very run heavy team this year. Okay, the run blocking line is not what it was three or four years ago when they were a dominant, you know, running team. And then goal line work, it's like J.K. Dobbins, sure, he might get some goal line work. He was awesome in that stretch at the end of his, I think it was his rookie year, where he popped off for a bunch of touchdowns. But like, again, what if they just want to give the goal line work to Gus Edwards? What if they want to give it to somebody else? Lamar Jackson is there too, so he's going to take a ton of goal line work. I think there are enough red flags where there are enough question marks. Can all of these things break right and be like fours or fives? Absolutely. But if you're going to be objective with yourself, J.K. Dobbins comes with a little risk. And I'm not necessarily concerned about his ACL, but like just because we're not concerned doesn't mean it's black and white and it's the correct answer. And with ETN, again, like that uh, that's one I did not factor injury risk into there. But they were on that podcast, they were pretty optimistic about his Liz Frank injury as well. It's typically 10 to 11 months to get back to like full explosiveness after the injury. It happened in August last year. So by around this time when they just said he was, you know, in at OTAs at 90 to 100 percent, 
this is the timetable for that happening. So it's realistic. It's not ahead of schedule like every other fucking NFL player in the world. So with that being said, that will wrap this up. We're going to do something super similar with the wide receivers in our next video. So make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. Hit the button that looks like this. Give us a thumbs up. Put the D in the subscribe. We'd forever appreciate you. Remember, gentlemen, stay away from them red flags. Love you. Get wild.